I will. I'm Sherry Cohen, and I'm going to call to um, talk, call to order the Human and Community Development Committee for Tuesday, April 13th, 2021. I think everyone seems to know this. Um, please use the mute button on the app, or if you're calling in, use the star six on your phone. Um, uh, to mention, we are, as permitted by the Governor's Disaster Declaration of November 13th, 2020, the determination has been made that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent for this committee. To ensure a transparent and open meeting is possible, we will post meeting minutes approximately one week in advance, provide a recording of this meeting, link down our website, and take all votes by roll call. So as we get started, first, um, Timmy Enrique, um, you have a few announcements you want to mention? Um, yes. Uh, so just off the top, um, uh, for, for those who know me, Timmy Cuellos, um liaison um, to HCD, um, I do want to just uh, make an announcement regarding um, I will be uh, leaving CMAP at the end of this month, um, bittersweetly. I will be moving to uh, the Chicago's Department of Housing to be a policy analyst there. Um, I am heartened that I'll be working on a lot of similar issues to what um, I engaged with at CMAP and many people on the committee and, and on the call will be folks that I'm still sure that I'll be interacting with. But um, just wanted to um, give everyone um, that heads up that uh, this was, is my last week at CMAP and well, certainly will be a process to identify uh, a new liaison um, to uh, help um, assist Enrique, um, who will be remaining. So um, that's my that's my bittersweet um, announcement. I, I really enjoyed spending time on this committee and getting to know um, all the different members and their various experiences and organizations that they work at. And um, and as I said, I'm sure we'll still um, have ways to keep in touch since I'm not going anywhere. I'll still um, very much um, be uh, in the region. Well, to me, I just, <laughs> unfortunately, we seem to get a lot of really great people that come and go, but um, I'm excited for your joining the city ranks um, and um, also to all of the um, the discussion from these uh, great committee members that will hopefully really continue to influence you as you influence the city's department on housing. So um, I wish you the best and thank you so much for all your work. It really has been helpful um, as a chair. Um, as you prepared everything and, and our work together. And Enrique, I know we'll continue to work together well, so um, we're in, I know we're in good hands, but thank you so much for all your work on this committee. It's really helped us gel, continue to gel. This is Lori. Uh, I'd just like to say I look forward to working with you at, at housing. I'm sad that you're leaving here, but um, MOPD is actually increasing uh, the work that we do with housing. So I look forward to working with you there. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Larry. I look forward to that too. Great. Well, thank you. Um, did um, Do you have any, are there any other announcements we want to make for the committee? I don't have the agenda in front of me. Are my are the agency announcements under this announcements and agenda changes? No, there's a an item after roll call. Yes, it's <laughs> item 4.0. So <laughs> soon, Thanks. yes. Well, yeah. I'll also just chime in here that Timmy, um, you know, I, I know the work on this committee. You could possibly even join the committee, you know, um, in the future, but we appreciate your work here at CMAP and always exciting to have our staff go on to implementing partners as well because the opportunities to, to learn and apply some of the research and work that we have uh, here at CMAP and, and take that and really run with it um, is, is really great. So we're excited for Timmy as well. Well, we're sad at the same time. Yeah. It's always that bittersweet kind of thing. But yes, again, congratulations and thank you for all your work that you're doing. Um, so next we're going to go on to for approval of the February 9th um, 
meeting minutes. So um, as we've done in the past, and I think we do it fairly well, uh, we want to uh, get a motion and a second to approve the um, committee's February 9th meeting minutes. So um, if you can unmute yourself and um, say so moved. Um, so first, if it's moved by someone for the February 9th committee meeting minutes. I'll move to adopt the minutes. Okay, that's Lori Dittman. And then anyone can second? Jackie Forbes, second. Great, thank you so much. So now we're going to, like I said, combine the roll call and approval of the minutes or vote on the minutes. So if you can please unmute, unmute yourself and I'll read the names of members and uh, respond with present and your vote either yay, nay, or abstain. And so I will say ahead of time that if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. <laughs> um, so anyways, hopefully I'll do okay this time. Uh, we'll start with Alicia Button. Present, yay. Thank you. Uh, Flutori Demirovsky. Okay, uh, Lori Dittman. Present, yay. Jackie Forbes. Present, yay. Joan Fox. Present. And um, do you have a vote on the minutes? I don't have a vote on the minutes. Okay, so abstain, I'm assuming. Um, Kendra yeah. Freeman. Melody Geraci. Jackie Grimshaw. Hannah Kite. Gretchen Knowlton. Present, yay. Thank you. Tiffany McDowell. Greg Pullman. Um, Obai Reed. Enrique Salgado. Raj Shah. President DA. Thank you. Rosalie Schemmer. Darnell Shields. Jana Simon. Sorry, President DA. Dominic Tochi and William Towns. Okay. Um, and uh, Enrique, what are what's our count? Are we? I think we we're good to pass. Okay. <laughs> All right. So it sounded like there was one abstentions, and I wasn't counting. Um, several, mostly uh, yays. So uh, the minutes pass. Or you can correct me if they don't. There. Um, okay. Next, we're moving on to then. Aaron, we're um, on for you. Thank you so much, our executive director, to give an update on the CMAP board meeting. Yeah, thanks again for the time this morning, Sherry and committee members. We continue to appreciate your commitment to the work of the agency. And I know you've got some good stuff on the agenda here. So, um, you know, I just wanted to fill in a couple of details that the last board meeting, we actually have a board meeting tomorrow. So I'll give you a little bit of uh, last board meeting and a preview of what's to come tomorrow. But last board meeting, we talked about the local technical assistance call for projects that we recently held. Um, we hadn't planned on holding a call for, for projects this year for technical assistance, but due to the pandemic and I think the needs that we were seeing across numerous communities, we decided to do a small call with the Regional Transportation Authority and really focus on communities that are in our high need um, and, and um, moderate need categories. So all in all, we selected 22 projects to move forward. These projects are much smaller than our typical LTA projects, and we're really focused on helping those communities uh, prepare for um, potential recovery funds that are coming down through the American Rescue Plan. Um, we're pairing the communities, high capacity communities with low capacity communities to talk about open streets or other strategies that might be uh, working in their communities that they can learn from right now. So excited about those projects that'll happen here shortly. 
The other thing I noted at last month's board meeting was our equitable engagement RFP. So we put out an RFP um, to help uh, get assistance designing a program that uh, that allows us to really make sure that we're taking into consideration the full breadth of um, experience and of pe people across our region. So, you know, oftentimes we do work at sort of a big broad policy level, but we want to make sure that the projects, the work, the programming, um, all of our work really sort of takes into consideration the diverse needs of stakeholders from across our region. So this program, this RFP, we've selected a consultant and over the first year, we are going to be working with them on designing a program for engagement. Um, again, and looking at specifically, you know, a responsive engagement program across the region. So not just, you know, thinking about sort of typically uh, Chicago, but recognizing that we have economically disconnected areas across the seven county region. How do we effectively engage um, stakeholder communities, but also uh, implementing agencies in terms of how they transition and, and design projects that better meet community needs. Um, so that was a little bit about last month's. I think this month's board meeting, we're spending a lot of time talking about what's happening on the federal level. Um, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan last month. Um, so in addition to the $30 billion that was in that bill for transit assistance to our operators across the region, there was $350 billion in emergency funding for state and local aid, um, money that's going to cities and towns. Um, we were excited to see this direct allocation. It's something that I know that the, the uh, membership organization like National League of Cities and National League of Counties had been advocating for to make sure that they had resources available to address the pandemic and, and resilient recovery. I think there were a couple um, additional funding opportunities that are of note that I wanted to mention to, to this that go beyond just sort of the direct allocation to local governments here is that there's a, a new $500 million low income household water assistance program that will be administered by the state that came through the American Rescue Plan. Um, a $28 billion restaurant revitalization fund that restaurants will be able to apply to the Small Business Administration for. And then $50 million in EPA, the Environmental uh, Protection Agency, environmental justice grants to minority and low income communities as well. So we will be continuing to monitor this, uh, these programs as they're developed. I mean, part of it is the funding is coming, but the rules might need to be revised or made. So it's, um, you know, as, as those details come to us, we will make sure to share them with all of you. Around this time of year too, um, I often would, I would be in DC talking to our Illinois delegation. Um, we did all of that virtually this year. One of the things that's been hot on everybody's mind is the, the concept of earmarks and these community projects. So if you um, heard that, it's a, they've revamped the earmark process of yesteryears and are thinking more strategically about how to advance smaller projects um, and projects that are already planned for. So there are a couple of benefits of this. I think it's been a little bit of a mad rush to get those projects um, into congressional delegations, our, our congressional offices, but we've been working with all of the staff um, for our delegation to send them, you know, what's, um, you know, what the councils have planned um, in their, their programs right now. So we've been doing some workshops with them. And then I think the other, Thing that I was going to mention too, but you're hearing a presentation on it, is the fares, fines, and fees work, which we're really excited about having gotten out. Um, we had some interest from the press last week, so we talked to WBEZ and we talked to City Lab. Um, but this is sort of our first look at the impact of transportation fares, fines, and fees on low-income households across the region. And I think for me, I'll just note this, um, and then I'll stop talking because I don't want to duplicate the presentation that you'll get here. But really the, the best thing we can do as a region, one of the best things we can do as a region is really think about how to better connect our multimodal transportation network so that people actually have access to that network to be able to get to jobs or housing or services that, that they need to live their daily lives here. So um, there are a number of other really great findings that we have here. I think the next steps um, after this report is, is out is to identify ways that we can then work with our local government partners to advance those 
Um, it's not sort of all of these things at once, but it's, you know, what's ready, what's primed, where can local governments um, begin to move the needle on some of these uh, fares, fines, and fees to make sure that we're thinking about equity um, as, uh, as they think about revisions to their fares, fines, and fees structure across the region. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions about federal stuff or anything else that's going on at CMAP. Um, I noted that there were some questions earlier about when we might be getting back into the office. We will start to slowly trickle staff in, I think on a voluntary basis over the summer, but our goal would be that by fall, we would have a more, um, more rotating, more solid rotating schedule of staff going back in. But again, we're monitoring the numbers. We know vaccines have just recently opened up for everyone. And I think also the timing on when we go back to in-person meetings, like committee meetings in the office will probably happen sometime even later than that, just because we know that there are lots of competing priorities. There's been some benefits of being on Zoom, but also too, we wanna make sure that you know, we're keeping our staff safe and healthy and, and, and you all as well. So that all of those things sort of by the fall, we might have a map for, but won't be fully implemented, I think until closer to the end of the year. Any questions? Great, thank you so much. Um, I guess it's more of a question than uh, this. I, I'm, I think, I imagine we're all interested in the work of the consultant for that um, uh, equitable engagement. So um, it'd be great to have sort of an ongoing discussion with them as that gets developed so we can learn and then provide any feedback if there's an opportunity to have um, that work connected. Um, great opportunity for this committee. Um, and then also to, I guess, first of all, I just, you know, uh, appreciate all your, as, uh, as we move in all the money being spent on the American Rescue Plan and all the other funding coming to um, municipalities and counties. And um, if there's a way of being able to share sort of what, what's happening in different um, areas with, among, uh, across the region, um, it'd be really interesting to learn and, and understand what's going on there, some of, some of the best practices. I realize some other people are doing that, um, I know sort of how we're doing it in Chicago uh, or some of the things that are being discussed and it'd be great to learn across the region um, if possible. Great, both both great points, Sherry. And um, and definitely we, we just signed the contract for the consultant on the equitable engagement RFP. So we will be, I think having a kickoff here in the next couple of weeks. And once we sort of have an understanding, I think the committees will definitely um, be hearing more about that and offer you an opportunity to sort of help us figure out how best to do this. Great, I think, like I said, I think that'll be a great opportunity. Um, did anyone else have any comments or statements? Okay, great, thank you. And I see that our numbers have gone up a little bit in participants. So if you have not, um, if you did not introduce yourself in the first part of the meeting, if you can unmute yourself and just say your name. Enrique Salgado. Hi, Enrique. We're just getting started as you can hear. Hi, this is Amy O'Rourke from Cook County Department of Public Health. Right, hi, Amy. And Greg, do I, I see, I see you, um, you're here, correct? Well, I guess I can see you, so I know you're here, but <laughs> I'm glad you're able to join us. Great. Hi there, this is Daniel Majesh here also. Great. Thank you. And did we want um, just the CMAP staff to, um, just introduce yourselves. Laurent Ayablame, CMAP. Yeah. Lindsay Hollander, CMAP. Jenna Gonzalez, CMAP. Caitlin Goodspeed, CMAP. Tim McMahon, CMAP. Oh. Allison Case, CMAP. Brianna Gibson, CMAP. Annie Parker, CMAP.
Okay, I think we got everyone. That actually worked pretty well. It <laughs> doesn't always go that way, but excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so next, um, as you know, we're having it's we have a great opportunity to learn more about our um, fellow committee members and the work that they're doing. And today, Lori Dittman from the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities at the City of Chicago uh, will be talking about the work of the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities and, and how um, the, the office has adapted to the um, current events with COVID with, um, and health equity and the other priority areas that you're working on. So uh, take it away, Lori. All right, thank you. Um, I just, um, we are, in terms of how we're, uh, first of all, I just want to introduce myself and the senior policy analyst for the mayor's office for people with disabilities. And we are um, uh, basically taking turns being in the office. Um, I come in more than I don't uh, anymore, but, but some people are still kind of phasing in and out so that we can keep our numbers uh, limited. Although the nice thing is that um, most of our employees have now been vaccinated. So, um, you know, we're more comfortable being back in the office and, and working together. Um, I just wanted to um, just generally, uh, MOPD works on uh, increasing the accessibility of all services and programs uh, provided uh, by the city of Chicago. And um, we do a lot with uh, accessibility and doing permit reviews and uh, making sure buildings are with code, are up to code uh, as it relates to accessibility. But we're also um, um, going more uh, deeply into a few other issues than, than we have in the past. So rather than um, webcam, just one. I love that one. Yeah. Rather than speaking about everything we do, I thought I would just follow the some dialogue. Audio. Um, things at, at this point. Um, you know, one the one thing I wanted to talk about was the mayor's office of equity and racial justice. Um, Sherry's probably familiar with this as, as anyone from the city, is that the mayor has really taken, uh, really made it an emphasis to look at all the work that the city does through a uh, racial equity lens. And I, I think that's been a, a great um, exercise and practice for all of us to do now is, is to really kind of step back to see what we do and see what we can do better to ensure that that racial equity is, is really um, uh, not only a part of, of everything that we do, but also leads every, everything we do. So um, just to give you some more information about that. Um, so as, as part of this uh, new office, so within the mayor's office, um, each department is expected to have it, its own Office of Equity and, and Racial Justice Committee that works internally uh, on these issues. And just so I could excuse my, my reading this, um, but I just want to make sure I, I, I was able to cover everything. And the goal of those, uh, the goal of, of the group in the mayor's office is working to change policies and practices in city government through engaging in training and support of city staff, cultivating engagement between city stakeholders and communities of color, and integrating racial equity analysis and accountability into the decision-making process. So the other, through that, they support city departments in developing resources and strategies to infuse racial equity working into our work streams on a permanent basis. Um, in addition to that, and, 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 and along with kind of the each department and, and looking at our own policies and, and priorities, there's also, uh, I also participate on a couple of committees uh, within the mayor's office that um, really focuses on racial equity in, in, in different ways. One is the Labor and Economic Policy Committee, um, and the other is uh, Food Policy. 
Um, and the food policy has just been uh, particularly interested, interesting in that it's uh, it, food disparity and, and uh, that has our, uh, really been a long time um, uh, issue within the disability community. So, um, so we're really, our, our MOPD's role is really doing it to look at with another layer of, you know, not only does, does uh, uh, you know, food disparity affect, uh, you know, different racial and ethnic groups differently, um, but also you add another layer of, of, of disability on that. And uh, it becomes even more of a problem, you know, because it's a different type of, of barriers that, that people have to um, uh, address. And um, nearly one third of all insecure, out, food insecure households in the US include an adults with a disability. So I, I think it's clear that um, uh, the disability community, you know, as, you know, as, um, uh, as members of, of, of uh, different groups are, are doubly in, you know, uh, impacted by, by food disparity. So that's one of the issues that, that we're, we're looking into. Other things we do is um, work in uh, civic engagement, participate in access among communities of color and those historically disconnected from city government. So as a committee at our department, um, as a, a group of our employees uh, uh, do presentations and trainings quarterly for, for the entire staff. And we just did this um, last week and we watched a video on redlining, um, which was very interesting and lightning. But what I was, you know, I think of, you know, anyone in Chicago is, you know, got to be familiar with redlining. And it was surprising to find out that, that many people didn't. You know, they, they certainly saw the effects of, of redlining, um, but really didn't see it as, you know, one of the very, you know, kind of institutional racist policies that, you know, that, that has unfortunately been in our city. So, um, so we did that, and then we discussed, um, you know, different issues or different terms like implicit but bias, systemic racism, systemic change, and equal access in terms of what all of those things mean. Um, moving on to another issue that we've been very involved in, and, and that's the response to COVID. Um, you know, more recently, our um, uh, compliance team has made sure that all the city uh, points of distribution are accessible to people with disabilities. We've surveyed those sites and, and made sure that uh, everyone can get it. And not just physical, but also um, communication access. Uh, it's something I think we're, we're also um, spending a lot more time on in terms of making sure that People are deaf or high, hard of hearing um, can can go to one of the pods or the United Center and be able to you know access um, <clears throat> the vaccines uh, along with with everyone else. Um, and we've also uh, coordinated blocks of vaccine appointments with different disability organizations. Um, so we've uh, worked with them to you know. Like, say, you know, give 50 appointments to a particular disability organization for them to fill. And it, it really works well, in, especially when someone is um, deaf or hard of hearing. So then we've been able to make sure that sign language interpreters are available and, and, other, and other means of access. Um, Finally, the other the other issue that I wanted to share with you that we um, have been working on um, for for a bit now is you know the mayor's uh, minimum wage ordinance that passed a, a number of years ago. Um, it included a provision that would eliminate uh, the disability exemption. Um, it's, uh, 
commonly referred to as the 14C certificate, which are issued by the US Department of Labor. Um, but the main point, what it, it does is it allows um, organizations and businesses and, and, and the like to pay people with disabilities less than minimum wage. So um, you've seen, we've seen this in uh, different sheltered workshop situations, you know, throughout the city and state, and uh, allows people to pay, uh, employers to pay people with disabilities by piece, um, meaning like there was one group that their contract was to stuff pillows for airlines. So rather than someone getting minimum wage to do that work, they would get paid, you know, maybe a quarter you know, for each pillow or a dime for each pillow. Um, and so, um, so the mayor in, in the minimum wage ordinance uh, is, is now banned this uh, in Chicago. Um, so what we're doing is, um, Organizations have until 2024 to comply with the ordinance. And so one of the things that we're doing is working with them, seeing what resources they need um, to make sure that they're, uh, the people they're employing are just don't become totally unemployed, but in fact, have the organizations work to make sure that, that people are getting minimum wage and competitive uh, wages for the work that they're doing. So um, there are some groups that have knew it was the right thing to do and have already been working on it. So some have, once the ordinance passed, you know, apply. And then there's a few that are struggling. Uh, they might be struggling for out of resources in terms of how to make this transition or they might be just struggling because uh, they're losing a bit, you know, losing a good deal. They've had, um, uh, you know, just paying um, people with disabilities, you know, uh, you know, literally pennies have, um, for, for the work they've done. So that's gonna be one of our uh, big initiatives um, this year is to work with those organizations. And uh, we, along with the mayor's office, are going to see, you know, what kind of assistance they need, or or what kind of nudge they need to um, to comply and and really uh, eliminate this this very fair unfair uh, labor practice. So um, those are just a few of the things that that I'm emphasizing now that I wanted to share with you, and um, I'm always you know happy to come back to. Oh. Talk about the other things we do as well. But I want to thank you for your interest. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, yeah, it's great to hear the range of activities and and focusing on this economic uh, equity issue is a great example of how we all need to work together and and advocate for fair labor um, within all communities. Um, does anyone Sorry. have any? Can you hear me? Yes, Greg. Hey, Greg. Yeah, I, I say hi. I say present, and I say yes on the on the me, minutes. But I want to ask Lori a question. All my um, I've had my staff in here four times trying to unmute me. Everything on screen is in Portuguese, so we're we had a bit of a problem. Um, anyway, Lori, um, in your the last um, initiative that you talked about, are you working closely? with um, the Department of Rehabilitation Services, Department of Developmentally Disabled and the Workforce Board to try and um, find and um, get jobs for individuals if, if they no longer, if the agency no longer can um, sustain um, the workforce? Yeah, I mean, I don't, um not maybe not maybe them specifically but we are going to be working with other organizations and and um uh you know to find resources so if people get dropped if people just lose their jobs we want to be able to provide a way to um you know ensure that that they can find jobs elsewhere 
and mm -hmm. I think there's a couple of disability organizations that are are also willing to do that. So yes, we are we are working with with different uh, agencies to make sure that people stay employed. And by the way, we pay, we've always paid minimum wage at the lighthouse. So yes, you yes you did. <laughs> In fact, you know, Chicago was um, in our, um, we have a certification program for businesses owned and operated by people with disabilities. And, um, and we've had that for, for, for many years. And it was the former president of uh, the Lighthouse, Kit, uh, Jim Kesselmoot, that worked with us on that ordinance. So we banned um, sheltered workshops or anyone from um, uh, that pays less than minimum wage from being able to get certified as a BEPD. And so this is something that um, I know is being worked on at the state level um, as well. Um, but thanks to the leadership of the Lighthouse, um, Chicago has been uh, ahead of the game on that particular issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then we know obviously this this issue may be, especially since you mentioned it here, but maybe not um, through the throughout the region, um, through CMAP's uh, involvement or interest in this, hopefully um, make sure this is a, a key issue um, as, as taking a look at economic equity issues across the region. Thank you. Um, were there any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Lori. We appreciate Thanks. it. And oh, it was, you know, it was uh, great to have an opportunity, like I say, and thank you, Timmy and Enrique, for starting this so we can get to know our members more and um, what everyone's doing. And in fact, later in the agenda, we will have a couple, uh, another presentation. So um, that will be good as we get to know each other. Um, so now we're going to move on to, and um, Aaron had um, alluded to, or mention quickly the um, equity in transportation fees and fees, fines, and fares project. Um, and so, um, where CMAP conducted this analysis of the impact of transportation fees, fines, and fares on community, especially on communities affected by inequities. So, we have our own Lindsay Hollander will be here to present the analysis finding and recommendations. And uh, Lindsay, are you you're there? I am here. Great. Well, take it away. Great. Thank you. Uh, I Well, Sherry pretty much introduced the project for me pretty well already. Uh, last year, uh, we came to this group to present about the beginnings of the project. But at this point, we've actually published the final report uh, about last year. Wednesday or Thursday, and I hope some of you have received it, and if not, we'll make sure it gets out to you. But I wanted to share uh, the work that we did and our next steps. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so our goals here were really to explore how ONTO 2050 recommendations to use user fees to fully fund the transportation system could be reconciled with ONTO 2050's recommendation to use the transportation network to promote inclusive growth. And we wanted to assess how affordable transportation fees and fines and fares are for residents with low income, and also the outcomes and consequences of those impacts, uh, including for how residents are able to access the transportation network. And not only have we focused on assessing these equity impacts, we've also developed strategies to reduce any disproportionate impacts that we might observe we observed through the analysis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, throughout the process, we engaged with a broad set of partners, and we've had many conversations with different experts and stakeholders across the region. And we also convened a group to engage uh, on a more regular basis with some of uh, our partners, actually a couple of whom are on this committee. And we met several times throughout the past year and a half to review our assessment of the equity of fees, fines, and fares, and also identify strategies to reduce those impacts. And 
but as I said, we have a broad group here, the transit agencies, the Tollway, Cook County, the city of Chicago, as well as others from the Center for Neighborhood Technology, UIC researchers, the Metropolitan Planning Council, and other civic groups. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as part of the process, we started by selecting several fees, fines, and fares for evaluation, and we did that in consultation with that group you just saw. And we're, we looked at the motor fuel tax and on 2050's recommendation for road usage charge. We looked at traffic violations and delinquency fines, transit fares, tolling, as well as on 2050's recommendation uh, to expand tolling looked at price parking, we looked at state and local motor vehicle registration fees, and we also looked at uh, transportation network company fees, uh, such as those that the city of Chicago and Skokie impose on Uber and Lyft rides. And we just, we again, we wanted to understand to what degree are residents with lower incomes impacted by these fees, fines, and fares, and then also are they disproportionately burdened by these fees, fines, and fares. Uh, next slide, please. And I wanted to start off by sharing some of the challenges that the region has in improving the transportation network. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one large challenge is that nearly 12% of residents of the larger Chicago metropolitan area live in poverty. And that rate's greater for residents living with disabilities as well as those who are Black or Hispanic or Latino origin. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our analysis of consumer expenditure data for the region, as well as national data, indicates that people in poverty often struggle to pay for even basic expenses. And often they're also unbanked or underbanked, meaning that they lack access or ability to utilize a bank account. In Illinois, it's estimated that 41% of households with an annual income of under $30,000 are either unbanked or underbanked. And next slide, please. And for these households, any expense, including the costs of transportation to work, school, and just everyday activities is often unaffordable. Uh, the cost of owning a vehicle is high and many households with low income and residents of color lack access to transit options that can connect them to jobs within a reasonable travel time. Uh, next slide, please. In fact, a CMAP analysis of several clusters of economically disconnected areas in the region indicates that many have high commute times. And in fact, across these clusters, those clusters with lower incomes tended to have even higher commute times. Uh, next slide, please. Another challenge we identified in our analysis of traffic fines concerns the intersection of enforcement of traffic laws and racism. And our analysis of Illinois traffic stop data in Northeastern Illinois indicates that drivers identified as black received more tickets than other drivers. Uh, in addition, they were more likely to be stopped. Uh, however, when stopped, less likely to receive a ticket than drivers identified by the officer as other races. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then another challenge is that the region's transportation system is in need of significant investment. And this is a major impediment to achieving the region's mobility equity goals. And particularly for transit, the system requires billions of dollars in additional investment over and above current sources over the next 30 years just to maintain the system we have today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I, I will move into our findings on fees, fines, and fares, which are quite extensive. Uh, today, I'm just gonna share a few. Uh, these fees, fines, and fares really f function as a part of the tax burden as a whole, where really any broad-based tax or fee has the potential to be regressive if it's not based in somebody's income level. Uh, the Nonpartisan Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy ranked Illinois' tax system as the eighth most regressive in the U.S., and that's due to its flat income tax and also comparatively low income tax exemptions. And this is a chart from their analysis, and it shows 
total taxes paid as a percent of income. And you can see Illinois taxpayers in that lowest 20% of incomes in the state pay 14% of their taxes or of their income in taxes overall, while those in the top 5% tend to pay less than 10% of their income on average. Uh, next slide. Uh, in our assessment of the equity in fees, funds, and fares, we focused really on households making less than 60% of the region's median income level. And when we started drilling down into the fees associated with driving, we actually found that motor fuel taxes and registration fees and tolls don't represent a, a disproportionate burden for households with low income. And why is that? Well, these households tend to own fewer vehicles and drive fewer miles than households uh, in other income groups. So for example, an average of 20 miles per day, which is less than half the regional average. And, this, and the fact that they tend to drive fewer miles and the fact that they tend to own fewer cars impacts the amount that they're paying in different fees. Uh, next slide, please. But when we looked at these same fees, we really found that these costs are um, basically one piece of the overall cost of driving, and that is what remains a high burden for households with low income without mobility options other than driving. And so while they do uh, drive less and own fewer vehicles because it is so expensive to drive, households with lower income still do drive. And most households with lower incomes in the region do own or lease a vehicle. And that results in uh, these households needing to spend a lot of their income on transportation. Next slide, please. Uh, as you can see here, our analysis indicates that households with low income in the Chicago area spend 16% of their income on transportation costs. And households with more income are able to, ded to dedicate less of their overall income to transportation costs on average. And most, and most of those transportation costs are for owning or maintaining a vehicle and really just a small portion of these costs are attributable to uh, transportation fees, fines, and fares. And next slide, please. Uh, residents of all income levels rely on transit in this region, but it tends to be especially crucial for residents who have lower incomes. Our modeling indicated that households with low income take 20% more transit trips than other households, but when you exclude work commutes from those calculations, these households take twice as many trips. And that uh, really indicates that they're just more likely to use transit for trips required to live their daily lives, like shopping or going to appointments. Uh, next slide, please. The cost of a fare tends to vary by many factors, and some of which uh, can result in the cost of taking transit to comprise of a relatively high share of earnings for a household with lower income. So as you can see on this chart, this provides an overview of the annual cost of buying transit monthly passes as a share of income uh, with example incomes in uh, green, blue and orange and you can see on the um on the green that's the that's the bar those are the bars for households with lower income and you can see depending on the service board or the service used whether it's CTA pace or metro that can vary but it, it's still significantly higher than households with median or uh, higher income levels on uh, next slide please uh, moving on to traffic violation fines. We found that households with lower incomes uh, pay a substantially larger share of weekly wages on a given fine than households with higher incomes. And with such a high burden, that means that some drivers aren't able to pay their fines and that can result in late fees, uh, next slide fees. And these fines and then any associated late fees can tend can compound and that can become a major source of debt for residents with low income. Uh, people with fine debt might experience bankruptcy, tax garnishment, or overall damage to their credit score. 
Uh, next slide, please. please. Uh, and before I move on to recommendations, I did want to pause to see if anyone had any questions about the findings. I will, looks like I don't, I don't see anyone piping up, so I will start talking about recommendations. Uh, in terms of our next steps, really working on improving mobility for residents with low income will require major investments in transit access, in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Uh, it will also require funding to administer programs. It may also require funding to recoup uh, revenue losses from potentially reducing fees or fares. And CMAP, as well as that resource group I mentioned earlier, we considered a variety of strategies to figure out which recommendations would best meet the goals of reducing the impacts on residents with low income, but also meet other on to 2050 goals. And uh, next slide, please. This is basically an overview of all of the uh, recommendations in the report, and I will go through each one of these. Uh, next slide, please. So first, an effective way to reduce the impact of the co of transportation costs as well as the cost of any fees, fines, or fares is really to provide people with an option not to drive. And to do that, we need to work toward implementing all the on 2050 recommendations to make investments in some of these lower cost mobility options like transit and then also bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. This chart shows mode share uh, by worker earnings. And the on the left, there are, are alternatives to driving such as public transportation, but then also walking to work or uh, taking a taxi even. And then on the right, uh, the driving modes, so driving alone or carpooling. And you can see that it varies across uh, income groups, but actually those in the lowest and the highest income levels in the region were more likely to take a non-driving mode. Next slide, please. Um, Lindsay, uh, just wanted to draw attention that um, uh, Committee member Enrique Salgado had a question. Um, I think it's about, um, well, the question was, was there data on where by zip code or municipality where the cost burden was the highest? Um, we don't, I, we did not analyze data by uh, a zip code or municipality for this project. I would have to, uh, look to see what might be plausible uh, through our modeling uh, in terms of more specific locations, but uh, we did not, uh, and, and, and I assume this is more of a question about uh, overall costs as well as uh, uh, vehicles, or as well as uh, average mileage. Um, that is something that we could look at in the future, though, which might be interesting. Uh, any other questions? Actually, the, the, what I was thinking about more was geographically, where if are there any clusters on, on where folks were most burdened, right, or most impacted? By overall transportation costs? Yes. So. That's something where I I don't know if we, so similarly, we'd have to look to see what might be possible with uh, our data and our modeling. I think that it, thinking about the uh, slide previously showing kind of highest commute times, or it's, well, don't go all the way back to it because it's, it's pretty far back. Um, it, that might be a basis for really looking at uh, transportation costs. So some of the some of those economically disconnected area clusters uh, with particularly high commute times, I'd be interested to look to see. Uh, and this could this could be uh, something that we look at moving forward. I'd be look I'd be interested to see uh, whether or not those higher uh, commute times 
translated to higher costs. But that isn't something that we contemplated for this project. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yep. It, yeah, just because, I mean, this is right, looking at transportation planning and policy and looking ahead. Um, and as transportation, the, how how communities are burdened, right? Uh, there's, I think, an, an equitable uh, issue that needs to be addressed, especially when you start looking at higher costs. I'm, right now, you break them down by income. And I'm like, in those communities, there's a shift and a change also in demographics and income uh, that's starting to happen geographically. And there could be correlations that could be made also where investments must be looked at in the future so that these these things don't become even bigger. Absolutely. And I think that there's a lot that can potentially be done in thinking about where can we make some of these transportation investments and increasing mobility options? And that's something I think as we uh, continue to look at our programming at CMAP, we'll be looking at. Uh, so, yep, yeah, I will. I will go on to the next recommendation, which is introducing more progressivity into the income tax. So that would reduce the regressiveness of the overall tax burden, and that would mitigate any impacts of any particular transportation fee, fine, or fare, as well as any other sales or excise taxes not based in income level. And there's a number of ways that the state could do this. Uh, this chart shows a few examples. So the state could increase the personal exemption, and that's in, um, that's in yellow on this chart. The state could implement graduated rates. Uh, some examples of that are in blue. And also the state could expand or increase the state earned income tax credit. Those are, those are several options to implementing more progressive strategies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, make transportation fees just more affordable for households with low income. And there are several ways that uh, the recommendation here provides for achieving this goal. One would be to uh, expand reduced transit fares and reduce vehicle registration fees to all households with low income in the region. Currently, just low income residents who are seniors or who have disabilities are eligible for uh, uh, these reductions. Uh, we would also recommend structuring vehicle registration fees to be based on vehicle value and also in the moving forward, structuring any TNC fees, uh, such as those on Uber and Lyft, to align with regional transit goals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next recommendation, improve access to lower cost tools for households with low income. And there are several ways that we could lower the fees or fares that uh, households pay, and we should really work on expanding access to programs like the Transit Benefit Fair program that already provides income tax reductions on the money that people spend on transit fares. Uh, for IPASS, uh, the tollway uh, is currently moving towards uh, cashless tolls, and as they as they pursue that policy and implement that policy, it'll be even more important to uh, find ways to expand access to IPASS, uh, particularly for uh, lower income drivers, especially those who are unbanked or underbanked. Uh, in the long term, though, potentially even developing a lower cost alternative to an IPASS transponder could reduce the need to require things like deposits on that transponder at all. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next recommendation, pilot initiatives that coordinate fee and fare collection. Currently, residents have to navigate uh, several public agencies to pay different fees or fares associated with their transportation. And simply making it easier for them to pay may increase compliance, but then that also may reduce the incidence of late fees and fines. 
And this could include initiatives that allow people to obtain an I-Pass or pay their municipal vehicle fees at the Illinois Secretary of State or other publicly accessible facilities. This also includes I-2050's recommendation to implement full fare integration across transportation service providers, including transit services and other modes of transportation. Uh, next slide, please. Make paying for parking more feasible for both residents and delivery drivers. It's important that there's short-term parking that people can pay for with a variety of payment options, as well as limited transaction fees. And this would help drivers without credit cards. It would help delivery drivers, and it would also help people just avoid paying parking fines if they can pay uh, for their parking easier. And next slide, please. And next is implementing a package of traffic and parking fine reforms. So uh, earlier this year, the state enacted legislative changes that eliminate holds on license renewal and also license suspensions for failure to pay traffic and red light tickets. But we think more reforms are needed. And for local governments, there are several areas to improve practices, including looking at assessing fine levels to make sure that they meet safety rather than revenue goals, and also reforming repayment plans. But really more broadly, we'd like to see fines structured so that people can actually afford to pay them. And to pilot a new structure, we would need changes to state statute to allow income-based fines or ability to pay waivers. Uh, next slide, please. So, Right now, we're really in the process of figuring out uh, our next steps on implementation, but there are, are gonna be a number of activities that uh, we pursue, and there'll also be activities I'm sure some of our partners will undertake. And I would be really interested in, well, one, hearing just feedback on the work, and then also how the recommendations align with the work, uh, that your agency might be doing and uh, whether or not there are synergies with your agency's priorities around equity. This is Jana from IPH. I just wanna mention that this all sounds great, but we just had you know, a vote on a constitutional amendment for progressive income tax in the state, and it was voted down. And so it's hard to think about um, how to move the public along in this opinion around changing the way we tax and change fee structures because um, we just tried and <laughs> tried several times, and the public won't go for it. So um, just the challenges there. And, you know, I think a lot of the folks on this call probably understand the need for this, but how do you move the public along in these conversations to get us to a changed tax structure? Yeah. I absolutely agree that this is something that is going to be challenging, particularly around figuring out uh, strategies for making the entire system more progressive. And we'd, we're going to try and think through how to uh, frame some of these issues moving forward. And we'd also be really interested to get uh, thoughts on how to make the case. Um, I, I would just add on, um, I, I, was a, I was a project team member of this project. It was, uh, I was really glad to see it released um, uh, right around um, my, my departure point. But at, at least uh, uh, one aspect for some help, as uh, Lindsay had, had mentioned, there have been some reforms to specifically traffic fines, which is where the area that I was focusing my research on, the, the, the General Assembly and the governor signed legislation on um, reducing the consequences of driver's license suspensions due to unpaid fines um, in the state. And so um, we think that th there's, there's potential for some um, movement on that, that nexus at least, uh, just to give one example, but uh, certainly, the broader point about the some of the tax changes um, are are still um, uh, outstanding. Uh, 
I, I for me, this that, that was part of where I was asking the question around, um, like how do you present this information or where what information is is perhaps lacking because when you think about this issue, is automatically is going to go into well, that's a city of Chicago um, problem, but increasingly. In our work, I work for a, a managed care organization, right? Um, we see transportation issues and costs uh, across the state um, and in places you wouldn't expect, right? Uh, so, so if you're able to show where there are, um, you know, that, that cost burden um, throughout the state, I think you, you'll be able to catch the ear of a lot of folks who don't think that this is an issue in their backyard. Uh, on top of that, if you take then that just that and then layer it over with changing demographics or even other transportation or even just walkability assessments. I mean, there's other other things that that uh, have been studied that people you can correlate right towards the lack of investment. Uh, towards public transportation and at the same time uh, workforce, right? Uh, even even just as overlay recently with COVID, um, where you started to see transportation, all of a sudden people were thinking about how far people have to travel uh, to and from work uh, in where they're. So those pieces overlay with the workforce. That, and I think there was a presentation in the last, in the last six months, I think, uh, around where um, essential workers live, <laughs> right? And th those, you can make correlations with that as well. So just painting it with different uh, broadening uh, of the issue, I think would, would help. Yeah. That's helpful. I think you're absolutely right that finding ways to integrate some of our other work and some of our other uh, analysis uh, on these issues is going to be helpful and that's that's a really good thought on workforce in particular especially as uh some of the challenges here are around work commutes as we uh, uh particularly uh when we think about what uh we've seen already on these high commute times in economically disconnected area clusters yeah you look at cost cost of living right cost you take cost of living cost of housing this essential workers and transportation. And right there, you, you have an economic inequity uh, and clusters that are in places and in counties in Illinois that you would not expect. Yeah. Yeah, and, our, and I do wanna uh, share that our analysis is really on, uh, it is on the whole region, it is not, Chicago specific. Actually, we do have one uh, analysis piece of analysis in the report that is a bit more Chicago specific about parking tickets because that was what that was the data we had. But other than that, uh, this is a this is a regional challenge. No, and that's the reason why I say Chicago because it, people think it's it just came on the news not too long ago, and I had a conversation with a friend of mine who lives you know, meeting on the outskirts of Naperville because it's ironically in that part cheaper than in Chicago, right? And then he actually yeah. diverts, you said the thing about iPads and I didn't even think about that. He diverts all the way around the small roads in order not to pay the tolls because it would kill him um, on there. And those are the, the kind of things that I'm like, you wouldn't expect, right? <laughs> Some place like Naperville, you know, to, to have to, look at cost and transportation uh, on there, you know, and then let alone throw in the maintenance on the vehicles just to keep it going, because if you're already economically disadvantaged, more than likely you're spending a lot of money on an older car to maintain so that you can travel too. <laughs> so. It's just, that's the story that needs to be told. Absolutely. Um, other other thoughts? 
Uh, Lindsay, I thought this was great, was really helpful. I guess there's one little question that I had of whether the findings from this and then, then the money that's going to be available for transit um, through the American Rescue Plan, I don't know how to, um, if that's able to integrate at all or influence some of the work that's being done, if that fits in there at all. I, I think it potentially does, uh, just thinking about, well, one, what sort of investments uh, the region should be making in improving mobility options, and then also uh, uh, how to look at the transit system moving forward and what opportunities could there be to, say, integrate uh, an expanded reduced fare program. That would be a great uh, result out of all of this as you continue your work. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for the real detailed information. Obviously, we know the slides for everyone will be available after the meeting is um, done. Obviously, this is your information there. So thank you so much. I appreciate that um, comprehensive look at that work of that uh, project. And thank next, you all. Next, we have um, uh, CMAP staff, Avery Good, is going to talk about the CMAP community snapshots, da uh, community data snapshots. And um, I'm sure you'll describe that um, includes um, broad um, sectors of data on demographics, housing, employment, transportation habits, um, which we've got um, a sort of uh, uh, some idea here, uh, retail sales, property values, and land use, and probably more. So, um, Avery, if you'd like to present from here. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. My name is Avery Goods, and I'm an assistant analyst here at CMAP. Uh, as Sherry said, I'm here to talk to you today about updates to the community data snapshots and to get your input on how we can improve the snapshots in the future. So I'll start off by giving you a brief overview of what the community data snapshots are and the process behind them. Then I'll go over some changes we're planning to implement for the upcoming release in June 2021. And finally, I'll be asking this group some questions and opening up the floor for your feedback. Uh, so next slide, please. So the community data snapshots are a series of annual profiles CMAP generates that summarize data about municipalities, Chicago community areas, and counties in the northeastern Illinois region. This slide lists out the topical areas covered in the snapshots. So we have, pop we have population demographics, housing, transportation, employment, land use, retail sales, water supply data, as well as onto 2050 indicators that CMAP developed. Uh, for most of these topics, we also we report the most recent available data, and then we also report changes over time, starting with either 2000 or 2010. I think it's important to point out that the snapshots are not reporting any key findings or recommendations. They're supposed to be simply designed as a central location for this information about our communities. Uh, we know that for this reason, they're often used by local governments and other organizations as a reference for grant writing. So most of the data in the snapshot comes from the Census's American Community Survey. We also incorporate data from the EPA, the Illinois Department of Employment Security, the Illinois Department of Revenue, and other data sets created by CMAP. I typically like to pull out some content that may be of particular interest when I talk to different groups about the snapshot. Uh, but in this case, most of the data in the snapshots really are only equity adjacent and not overtly related to equity. So I'll go ahead and plant the seed now for our discussion at the end of this presentation for this group to think about any equity data you think should be included in the snapshot. Uh, on that note, I'd also like to add that one of our key challenges is finding data that's consistently available across CMAP's Southern County region. I think that's important to keep in mind as we discuss any potential data additions. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a screenshot I took from a 2020 snapshot for Cicero. Uh, I included this to give you a sense of how the snapshots are presented right now. So they're currently made up of tables that contain data for the main community, as well as comparison data for the county it's located in and then the region as a whole. Uh, the snapshots are PDFs that run about 20 pages long and they can be individually downloaded from our website. They're designed to be easy to read, print out, and grab data from. I'll also note that we're exploring creating a web-based version of the snapshots uh, that's a bit more interactive, but we have no plans to implement this within the next year and certainly not by the 2021 release. 
so I know that was a lot of information, so I'll pause there for any questions about snapshot content or what they are. Okay, if there's no questions there, we can move on to the next slide. So I'd also like to give you a brief overview of the quality control process that occurs after we've gathered the data and generated the initial snapshot every year. Uh, so currently we have three rounds of internal review. This starts with the research and analysis teams who make the snapshots, then moves to staff and planning and implementation and government affairs, who work a bit more closely with the communities and are more familiar with them. And then uh, lastly, our communications teams review the snapshots. After every round of review, we make revisions until the snapshots are ready to be published on our website. We also publish the raw data that goes into the uh, snapshots as CSV files to the CMAP data hub, so that's also publicly available to download. <coughs> One thing we're going to test out in the next cycle is sending the snapshots out for external beta testing before the snapshots are published. We're imagining that our external testers will be in local governments or expert stakeholders who are more familiar with their communities than we are and can provide additional feedback on how well the snapshots capture their communities. Uh, I saw that uh, it looks like Enrique asked, will the two, uh, 2020 census data be integrated into the snapshots? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, they will, but not this year because they won't be available yet at this point. Uh, so we'll be working with the 2019 American Community Survey data. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the ways we solicit feedback about the snapshots is a survey that's linked on the snapshot web page as well as on the snapshots themselves. Every year we get a couple of responses to the survey. This slide is some of the suggestions from that survey for data to include in the snapshots. I'd note that uh, for some of these, we likely would not be able to find reliable data, but I think it's still good to give you an idea of the feedback we've already received and what people are interested in adding to the snapshots. So we have some more data about young children, uh, some different ways to present income, some housing trends, uh, some people would like uh, the margin of error to be included in the data, as well as some public health, crime, disability, and retail sales data they'd like to see included. Uh, next slide, please. So last but not least, I'll open up the floor with some questions for this committee. So the first discussion question is if there are any data points about communities you'd like to see reported in future versions of the SNAP in the snapshot. Uh, for this question, I'd love to hear about data you're regularly using in your work or anything your organization prepares that you uh, think could make the snapshots a more robust and useful tool. Uh, if there's any data that you'd like to see but don't know of an existing source already, I think that's also okay to call out here too. Uh, it looks like Gretchen posted a question in the chat. Uh, will you do any county level snapshots? Yes, we do currently produce snapshots for uh, the seven counties of the CMAP region. Uh, Lori, what data is currently being collected for people with disabilities? So currently we don't have any of this in the snapshot, but I know there is a lot of this uh, available in the, the American Community Survey, uh, and we're looking at incorporating this into future snapshots. I, I have a question. Um, I was, um, Lori, based on your question, is there any indicators that would be helpful uh, to add to the snapshots? I think you're muted, Lori, at least on my end. I couldn't hear. Can others hear Lori or is it just me that's having the issue? I unfortunately can't either. 
Maybe we can follow up with Lori. If um, Lori, you want to type them into the chat, or we can follow up after the presentation as well. It seems like we're having trouble. So this is Sherry. Um, I was just wondering how um, or how you connect with other um, municipalities that have like dashboards. Like, so we're going to be. We, well, we have our um, Chicago um, uh, uh, community profiles, um, and we're also going to be developing for the city of Chicago doing an equity dashboard. So um, I didn't know if you were um, wanted to focus on that also, or and if you're or how you're connecting with other municipalities and counties on their data and snapshots. Yeah, that's a great question. We don't currently have a really standard way we're connecting with other organizations and governments uh, on the snapshots, but I would love to see this equity snapshot and uh, think there's a lot of opportunity for us to further connect with other organizations on how they're doing similar uh, projects. And this is Jana at the Illinois Public Health Institute. I just wanted to add that there's a currently um, legislation in the Illinois General Assembly that we have been advocating for called the Healthy Illinois Survey. So in Chicago, there's a Healthy Chicago Survey that really digs into social determinants of health data. Um, and it's enough of a sample that you can get down by zip code and community level. And so we're advocating for that same type of survey across the entire state, to really dig into those uh, data points in suburban Cook County, um, Lake County, all those sort of more populous counties outside of Chicago that don't have that granular data and make sure there's a representative sample of that. So um, if you're interested in supporting that, it's House Bill 34, 3504. Um, it's Representative Gonzalez. Um, and it, um, we would need to pass the bill itself and then get the appropriation for the survey, which is estimated at 4.7 million into the budget. So it's, big, it's a big ask, but if you're interested in that kind of data, um, it's around all sorts of things around um, you know, food security, housing, uh, economic, and educational data points, all that stuff at the zip code level across the state, um, considered it's possible again, 3504. So I just wanted to put that out there. It's hopefully something to think about um, having access to statewide. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Is, is workforce? Um, one of the the fields uh so yes we do uh, have some data related. Related. uh we do I have some data questions related. for me or for someone else <laughs> uh. so i guess we're back to the workforce is it um on the community uh data snapshots uh, yes, we do have some workforce data currently in the snapshots. So we have um, some information about what kind of jobs people are doing, what sector they're in, uh, where they're going to work, their commute time. Um, and I believe that uh, generally captures the workforce data we currently have. Is there any workforce data you'd like to see that isn't included in that? Well, I think the conversation, yeah, and, and I don't know how to frame this because the conversation has recently been had around um, like remote work, right? the ability to do remote work and not to do remote work um, and where those clusters or jobs are. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, as manufacturing, et cetera, uh, jobs like that uh, move further and further away. Um, there, there's a specific service sector that's, uh, or manufacturing sector, workforce sector that's not able to have the luxury that, or the privilege that, I, you know, I have right now working from home. Uh, and I think that that's that should be put in there because that, that offers a lot of other issues. Uh, also broadband, I, I would put in there because that right now is 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 affecting not only uh, work, education, but also health. 
Yeah, definitely. These are really great points. I um, don't know of any existing data on um, like where people can work from home and where they can and what sectors, um, but I think that would be super useful to include. I uh, know that there definitely is some uh, information we can get from the American Community Survey about where people have access to internet, uh, and I think that that would be useful to include as well, and we'll note that. It might be more um, job type, whether they um, can work from home um, as opposed to work, you know, um, and have to go to a location. But I think this is great. So I guess, um, um, as you were saying here, if we have, if anybody else has any suggestions to send it to Avery or um, send it to Enrique and um, to make sure that um, those uh, suggestions get forward. And um, I don't know if you saw that Lori put in, sorry, you're having problems with the, with the um, platform, but she's uh, she was just saying that they are in need of data of different types for, for different types of, by different types of um, disabilities, for example, or that is employment with people with mobility um, disabilities uh, versus deaf slash hard of hearing. Um, so if data could be broken down by um, those different components of disability. Yeah, thank you, Lori. Um, that is definitely something we can explore. I think that data is out there. Uh, so I'll note that that's something that uh, would be useful to have in the snapshots. Great. And then for people didn't notice in the chat, there is a link to where the um, snapshots, the current snapshots are currently are held, are stored. So next, we'll be moving on. So thank you very much, Avery. That was really helpful. It'll be great to um, uh, see how these are changing and sort of the response and, and how we can continue to help um, build them up. So thank you so much. Um, and next, as you can see uh, from the great uh, slide here, uh, we are going to have um, Jana Simons from the Illinois Public Health Institute and Amy O'Rourke from the Cook County Department of Public Health are going to present on um, Active People, Healthy Illinois, Connecting Active Friendly Routes to Everyday Destinations, which obviously really is a nice um, uh, connection to the transportation presentation that we had earlier. So um, thank you so much for presenting. Great, thanks Sherry. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Jana Simon. I'm a program director at the Illinois Public Health Institute. I think I spoke on the last meeting or maybe the meeting before that with a sort of high level overview of some of the funding we have right now from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, really focused on using the built environment to promote physical activity. And so we wanted to dig in a little bit more onto one of the specific um, activities we've been doing with the Cook County Department of Public Health. Um, and Amy has joined me to say more about that. But if you can go to the next slide, I'll just briefly remind folks who weren't on the last call um, what this grant is all about. Um, so we are in a five-year cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and it's called the State Physical Activity and Nutrition Program Grant. So it's about a million dollars a year, um, almost a million dollars a year for five years, really focusing in on physical activity and nutrition interventions. Um, we are focusing on communities hardest hit by chronic diseases um, and some regions of focus, including the Chicago Cook County region, um, as well as others in the state. Um, and it's a nice collaboration of a lot of different partners um, and the state health department and us working on that. Next slide. Um, you can see the four strategies here. The one that's on built environment and physical activity, um, sort of the uh, language the CDC is using is connecting activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations. So we're really looking at improving walking, biking, transit systems that promote physical activity. So typically we know, um, you know, to get, if you build physical activity into your everyday life of how you get to places, um, it naturally can fit in um, and you don't have to worry so much about quote unquote going to the gym if you're being active throughout your day. So it helps increase physical activity. Um, so we won't go over the other three strategies, but that's the one where this strategy really fits in. So next slide. Um, again, we have these three re geographic regions of focus. And then of course, within each region, we have priority populations. So we're looking at communities who are low income, rural communities, and communities of color, predominantly African-American and Latinx. Um, and so those are the priority populations um, in our statewide work as well as within these three regions. Next slide. 
Um, so just a few high level activities we've done. Um, we've been collaborating a lot with the Active Transportation Alliance as our technical assistance partner. Um, and so we have been starting to do some statewide work. We did start um, an active People Healthy Illinois listserv. So we are inviting planning, transportation, land use, and public health partners to come together in the listserv to share resources and information with each other. And you can let me know in the chat box or emailing me if you want to join that. Um, but we also started this statewide learning collaborative related to the state's ITEP funding last year. So um, as many of you may be aware, the state ITEP program had a huge influx of money from the capital bill that passed to support biking and um, walking infrastructure programs. And so because there was such a large increase in the amount of money, um, it was something like $75 million new um, for this last cycle, we were able to do a collaborative with Active Transportation Alliance leading it to really walk people through um, the application process and what would make a strong application. And so we did a learning collaborative with 15 communities um, that were sort of medium to low capacity communities who I think over half of them had never submitted an ITAP, ITAP application before. Um, we provided um, sort of in-depth TA to them to get them ready, identify you know, good projects and get their application um, ready. And then we also hosted three statewide webinars where we had about 630 unique participants joining to really walk through the application requirements with folks. So, um, and we had representatives of, of IDOT on the call to really answer questions. And so um, we think, you know, over 22, uh, I think it was something like 21 and 22 biking, uh, each biking and walking miles were applied for through the 15 communities, plus, of course, uh, you know, hundreds of applications into the ITEP fund. So hopefully we'll hear about which of those projects were funded in the coming months once IDOT releases that. Um, but we will be repeating this process next year for it's a every two year cycle funding. And so we'll be repeating it next year. And we're also planning for one with the Safe Routes to Schools funding opportunity later this fall as well. So if you know communities that could use some assistance in applying to some of these funds for biking and walking infrastructure, um, we are trying to support those groups. So next slide. Um, and then that's the statewide work. We've also had, of course, local implementation going on. So um, in Southern Illinois, for example, um, we did a community sidewalk audit, um, created a sidewalk prioritization plan, and then the mayor actually got $100,000 and used the plan to invest in sidewalk infrastructure. So it's a really nice um, small town example of how a plan changes. Um, and ATA worked with Carbondale to do a bikeway conditions assessment. But we're doing these types of things in, the, in these regions. And in Peoria, we're really looking at their complete streets implementation, um, really at the technical level. And then in Cook County, um, we have Amy here. They're doing lots of things around um, complete streets with the South Suburban Mayor and Mayors and Managers Association. But they've also really looked at the way to get funding out. So if you go to the next slide, I think I'll turn it over to Amy at this point, and she can tell you a little bit about um, what's going on in Cook County. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks so much, Jana, and thank you everyone for inviting us to participate and talk more about our work with South Suburban Mayor's Managers. Um, so if you can advance to the next slide, please. Um, so I'll just provide a brief background on the collaboration between the Cook County Department of Public Health and South Suburban Mayors and Managers. Association. I'll highlight the importance of the strategy, the strategy, and how health considerations are being integrated into surface transportation program funding, and then describe how we're using data to identify priority areas in suburban Cook County. And then I'm going to highlight some of the next steps. Um, you can advance to the next slide. Um, so in our work with South Suburban Mayors and Managers Association, they identified um, an opportunity to update the surface transportation program funding criteria before the recent call for proposals. Um, and with that, we identified jointly an opportunity to include health considerations into this criteria as an important strategy to advancing active friendly environments and directing resources towards communities and populations most impacted or affected by inequities. So this policy um, approach, it considers health, sustainability, and equity. So the Cook County Department of Public Health um, and SSMMA identified an opportunity to include complete streets and green infrastructure as an additional incentive for this policy adoption um, and implementation. 
Um, and, and we also recommended, um, we were tasked jointly to identify additional health considerations to include in this updated criteria. Um, so again, at the core of CCDPH's work is the goal to achieve, in achieving health equity. Um, and this goal is particularly important for those most vulnerable, so low-income communities of color, the elderly children and people living with disabilities. Um, so with that, um, you know, we identified um, an opportunity to use socioeconomic and demographic de data um, that we can identify using this data, we can identify priority areas within suburban Cook County where transportation funding may be of most need and can make the most, um, the most impact and can most improve quality of life. Um, so with that, um, you can advance to the next slide. We identified the opportunity to integrate then the social vulnerability index um, scores in the criteria. Um, so the social vulnerability index is one tool that can help us assess socioeconomic and demographic data. So again, this is a tool, um, this index is developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and it me measures the degree of vulnerability in communities. It measures overall vulnerability relative to other groups, and it was originally intended to identify the most vulnerable during a disaster or a public health emergency, much like you know, the pandemic now, where as a health department, really leveraging the community vulnerability index score to help us in making some critical decisions and where we're allocating and directing some additional resources in addition to COVID-19 surveillance data. Um, so again, it, this is an important tool for the health department. And again, we were thrilled to have this, this social vulnerability index scores integrated into um, some decision-making around resource allocation. Um, it's important to note that people living in the same area, as you all know, are not equally vulnerable. Um, SVI um, presents an opportunity to address the unique social determinants of health of populations that are often neglected, forgotten, or ignored in the planning and development of community resources. Um, so you can advance to the next slide. Usually, um, the SVI data is um, calculated at the census track level, but was modified by CCDPH for this project to yield an overall community level ranking for each of the 45 South Suburban Mayors and Managers Association communities. Um, so again, this data is being pulled from the U.S. Census Bureau 2013-2017 American Community Survey. Um, and again, what we did was we modified the census track level data to um, really apply that to a com at a community level, so at the municipal level, to help inform with um, some scoring. Um, the percentile rank was calculated for each of the 15 individual variables. So again, the SVI is looking at different variables. It's looking at socioeconomic status, household composition, minority status and language, housing and transportation. And then those um, variables all are all summed and ordered and a final overall percentile ranking was calculated for each community. Um, you can advance to the next slide. Um, so with that, the final overall percentile ranking was multiplied by 10, yielding a final score ranging from zero to 10 points. These scores then were applied to the um, applications um, of these municipalities for their surface transportation program applications. Um, again, these percentiles are relative measurements, so each community is compared to the others within this region. Um, it's important to note that there are some limitations on using this type of data um, and incorporating this data. Um, if you can advance to the next slide. Some of the limitations in using this index is that there's rapidly changing compositions of suburban communities, and that was highlighted in some of the previous presentations, um, especially in suburban Cook County. Um, the index measures were uh, where people live, not where they work or play. So that's also you know, something to factor in. And again, we are you know, bringing this from the census track up to the municipal level to support with this planning and scoring, um, but municipal level data data mask inequities at the census track level. So that's something that we're um, you know, mindful of and um, based on how we 
leveraged this data and applied it to the service transportation um, criteria. Um, you can advance to the next slide. So um, we were, so we successfully worked with SSMMA and their transportation committee to review and approve the updated STP funding criteria back in August. Um, and it was finally approved in September and was part of then the recent call for projects back in January 2020. So again, um, this was one of um, the health criteria that was a part of and incorporated in um, the, the, the recent call for um, STP funding. Um, with that, a total of 19 transportation projects were funded, totaling $35 million. I will just highlight that a total of 64 applications were actually submitted for a total of $153 million. And in conversations with SSMMA, um, you know, this is the greatest, it's our understanding that that was the greatest number of STP applications submitted in Chicagoland, more than Chicago, and the second most dollars requested behind Chicago. This was the first call for projects ever with community match, and the large number of applications submitted really underscores the need for transportation resources and funding for these types of projects. So again, ultimately of the 64 applications submitted, 19 were selected and funded, um, totaling $35 million. And with that, then many of the applications were from municipalities with high social vulnerability index scores, as well as many were awarded applications were from municipalities that have recently passed complete streets policies. Um, so again, um, an opportunity to direct resources to communities to support implementation of their com complete streets policies, as well as you know, creating that type of incentive for that type of policy change, local policy change, as well as directing resources to communities that scored high as far as vulnerability. Um, and we're really using that as a, a proxy for equity um, in our planning. So as far as moving forward, SSMMA and CCDPH will continue to evaluate the impact of health criteria integrated into this surface transportation funding methodology. SSMMA and CCDPH will present, um, plan to present on impact of health criteria inclusion at a future um, I-SPAN I um, webinar as um, as Jana pointed out, some of the, the opportunities for us to share this information and share outcomes. Um, so we look forward to, to working on that. And then SSMMA plans to continue to include health criteria in future calls for projects as well. Um, and then I did include then my contact information if anyone has any questions specific to this work, but I'm happy to, if there is time to answer any questions now too. Thanks, Amy. I think if you advance a couple of slides, you'll get to her contact information up there too. So thank you, Janet and Amy. So I had a question. How long are the projects? Um, are they, I know you're saying that there was a million that's, each year. Yeah, that's a great question. So they are um, five-year funding projects, I believe, um, is the time frame. Um, so, so again, these are multi-year projects, funded projects, um, and um, they will be, um, so they were awarded funding in 2021, I believe. You know, they were selected in 2020, awarded in 2021, and they go, the projects are between 2021 and 2025, I believe. And, and um, is um, CCDPA, I'm sorry. Well, is CCDPH um, going to continue to be involved to help, like, sort of advise with the, especially with the ones on the complete streets? Um, so, so we're working closely with SSMMA, who is the technical expert and technical assistant in providing local technical assistance in advancing complete streets policies um, and supporting with, you know, implementation of complete streets policies locally. So CCDPH works directly with SSMMA on that. So yes, Sherry, we're going to continue to be involved and then we're going to continue to be involved in you know, exploring and evaluating the impact of leveraging and integrating these health criteria into the STP funding um, and then explore if there's a need to make any type of modifications to the criteria that was included 
um, in the methodology um, as we move forward for future funding opportunities. And wouldn't it be great if we got a healthy Illinois survey and it could ask some questions about uh, uh, how uh, how likely are they to use you know walk or bike and and um, and how that happens in their community. So that would be wonderful. Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> Did have anyone else have any questions or comments or? Thank you. Well, this is, this is great. And I mean, obviously it connects to a lot of the work that CMAP is doing. So um, I think it's, I appreciate your being able to present on this um, today. And, um, you know, it'd be great to sort of if there's an update or, you know, as the years go by um, to see where that goes and, and, and how we can move um, more or uh, municipalities to have this kind of complete street um, uh, process in place um, and, and see how that will impact our communities. So thank you so much. And as Amy pointed out, we'll have a, um, we'll, uh, we'll have a more in-depth workshop on the outcomes of this later this year, probably once we um, see more about how these projects are rolling out. Great, well, thank you so much. And again, it adds uh, depth adds depth to um as we're always getting to know each you know uh, the work of our organizations to of iphi and uh, ccdph so thank you so much um next we just have a few more items on our agenda probably go quickly um any agency announcements timmy or enrique no further announcements okay great any other business that needs to be brought to the committee Okay, so now we're in public public comment um, area. Uh, were there any um, uh, comments submitted prior to the meeting? We did not receive any uh, written comments in advance. Okay, and are there any comments currently that anybody wanted to make for his public comment? All right, well, then we will move to um, our next meeting is uh, Tuesday, June 8th. Um, I'm, it sounds like we'll still be on our uh, this uh, platform because um, it's it's I think it's really for the most part working really well unless we have a snafu. Um, so I appreciate that and, and um, a lot of this information will come out and thank you for following up uh, Timmy and Enrique. Um, and again, just to say thank you, Timmy for all your work on this. We really appreciate that and best of luck to you uh, in the city. <laughs> and, um, and Enrique, looking forward to work, continuing to work with you. So uh, we just need a um, motion to adjourn. A motion. Okay, I think that's Enrique. And um, so thank you. I think, I don't know that we need to, do we need a second on that? I'm not very good with that. Okay, <laughs> so we will adjourn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I think it if you need it. Okay, we'll take it. Thank you, Jana. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Lori. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Jana. Thank you, um, Avery. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, everybody. And have a wonderful day. And we will see you in a couple months. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody.